All right, so we're going to start off our course in chapter six of our textbook, which misses things up a little bit. It means that we're starting a little bit later. We're skipping over calculus. We're going to come back to that later on. We're going to start with with the vectors unit of the course. And chapter six is all about geometric vectors. Uh, vectors you, you may be a little bit familiar with if you've taken some physics, but we're going to go over things nice and slowly to make sure that, that everyone's comfortable with the terminology that we use in math class, which, which will be a little bit different than how we did it in physics. So the first thing we need to cover is just uh, some basic definitions of a scalar versus a vector quantity. And we're used to dealing with scalars. Vectors are a little bit different. Uh, a scalar quantity is, is simply a measurement that only includes a number. So we're used to that as far as speeds and, and volumes and areas, uh, distance, um, things that we, we calculate all the time in class. A vector quantity is something that, that still has that number characteristic, but it also needs a direction to it. So some sort of a some sort of an idea of where something is going. So for example, a, a speed could be 15 kilometers an hour, and that's simply a number. A velocity would be 15 kilometers an hour going north. So we've added in that extra direction that's including where things are moving. Now the tricky one on there is mass and weight. With mass, mass, mass is a, it's a value that's, that's just present in something. And it's called an intrinsic value because it never changes. So it's all about the amount of matter in there. Uh, weight is a little bit different. Uh, weight depends on where you are. So your weight will be different whether you're on the Earth or the Moon, for example, because you calculate weight by using the formula math mass times acceleration due to gravity. And of course, your acceleration due to gravity is different depending on where you are. On, ner on Earth, it's 9.8 meters per second squared, whereas on the moon, it's going to be something completely different. So your, your mass will be the same no matter where you are. Weight will be different. Now, I'm saying that weight's a vector quantity, which means you need a, a direction to it. But in this case, because we've got the acceleration due to gravity, your weight would be downwards. Right, where the gravity is going to pull you down. So that's why we have, that's why we're going in that direction. Here we want to represent a geometric vector. So a geometric vector is basically just a line segment, but we need to make sure that there's an arrow on it or, or some way of indicating a particular direction that we're moving. So there's a couple different ways that we can indicate. We can draw it certainly. Um, and then I've labeled it in two different ways. I've called it vector V. And what I want you to notice in the way that that's written, uh, it's it's just a lowercase v with then an arrow on top of it. And the way I usually draw it is actually with a, a straight line and then just one little tick to make the arrow symbol. So it looks a little bit different than the, the notation that I have on the, that the computer was able to give me. The other way to write it is listed below here. This one, they're, they're both useful. We'll use them in different circumstances. This one's called vector a, b. And that's giving an indication of a starting point. So we're starting at vector, starting at point A and going to point B. And you can really see that in the diagram. We have point A, which is our tail. The tail is considered our starting point. And then we're going along this particular direction. And we're ending up at point B, which is called the head. So starting point to end point. And one of the most important things about vectors, which we're going to have to deal with, and it's going to sort of come up quite a bit as we go along through this course, the idea of this vector is not, it's not as important that we've started at a particular location, but rather how far we've gone and what direction we've gone in. And we'll talk more about that as we go. But keep in mind, it's not important that we started at exactly this spot right here. What is important is that we've moved in a particular direction. So if I pick this vector up, and move it down to here, we would still refer to that as vector v. The fact that it's on a different spot on the board really doesn't make a difference for us. What matters is that it's a particular distance and a particular direction. The next thing that we need to talk about is a couple of properties that we can have with vectors. Uh, and one of those is called equal vectors. And I don't think this will surprise you too much. Um, Two equal vectors are simply two vectors that are the same. So in order to be the same, two things have to happen. Remember, a vector has a magnitude and a direction. So for these to be equal, they have to have both the same magnitude and the same direction. Uh, 
um, it's not as easy to draw them and make them look like they're in the same direction. Uh, but certainly we can use our little uh, line symbols here to indicate that they have the same magnitude. Now what we'll write is we're going to say vector A is equal to vector B, and that's indicating that these are in fact equal vectors. So as we write that, as soon as I write this statement right here, that's indicating two things. It's saying that the magnitudes are the same, and it's indicating that the directions are the same. So we get both of those properties out of that one statement. This one written down below, it's got our absolute value symbols used. And the absolute value symbols are, what they're representing here is the length or the magnitude of these particular vectors. So in this case, we're saying that the magnitude of vector A is equal to the magnitude of vector B. So from this statement here in the blue box, that implies that the magnitudes have to be equal and in turn the directions are equal as well. Now something to keep in mind, if I told you this, if I tell you that the magnitude of vector C, remember that means the length of vector C is equal to the length of vector D, does that necessarily mean that vector C and vector D are equal? Is that a true statement? And the answer to that, of course, is no. There's there's lots of ways that we could make this happen. For example, here's vector C, and let's pretend it's five centimeters long, and here's vector D, and it's five centimeters long. So the magnitudes are the same, but certainly the directions are not. And so in that case, we've satisfied the first requirement, but it's not true that they're equal to each other. So we have equal vectors. Similarly, we can have opposite vectors. And this is a very similar idea, except now we're just changing the direction. So the magnitudes must be the same. Magnitudes here have to be the same. But this time, the direction of the two vectors is completely opposite. So for example, one vector would be north, one vector would be south, right? Completely opposite directions. And you can see that in the picture. The way we write that is we can write vector A is equal to negative vector B. So the negative sign is indicating the, the opposite direction. So if I had written vector A equals vector B, we're saying they're exactly the same. By writing vector A equals negative vector B, what we're saying is that the magnitudes are the same, but the directions are opposite to each other. Okay, here's an example for us. Um, just a picture that we've created. We've got uh, some points, P, Q, R, S, and T. And what we want to do is try and state all the opposite and all of the equal vectors that we can. And there are lots in this picture. Now you have to look carefully and notice where the arrows are, because in this case, I've, I've made it specific that these have particular directions. We'll be able to play around with that in the next few days as far as how we're going to describe the, the direction of vectors. But for now, let's just go with the direction of the arrows. What we want to do is, is just take a look at the picture and see if we, we see any that we would consider to be equal. So let's, let's do the equal vectors first. So if you take a look at the, just the horizontal lines, vector PQ, so I write that, I say P, start at point P, go to point Q, and it's a vector. So I put the little vector symbol over the top. That is exactly the same as vector SR, right? We, we write that they're equal to each other. They're exactly the same vector. That's one. Uh, and then if we look at our vertical lines, they're both pointing downwards. So vector PS is exactly the same as vector QR. So those would be equal vectors. For our opposite vectors, now we're looking for vectors that would have the the same magnitude but different direction. Now I suppose we have to make sure we, we know what we're talking about here. Uh, I'm assuming that point T is right in the middle of this square, 
and granted, I never really said that this had to be a square, but that was the intent of the diagram. So if we want opposite vectors, we could look at the vector from T to P and the vector from T to R. And those certainly have the same magnitude then if T is in the center, but the directions are completely opposite. We're going to the two opposite corners. So the way we'd write that is we would say vector TP, that's one of the vectors we're talking about. And we're also talking about vector TR. And I, I wanna put an equal sign there, but the equals isn't quite right. The, the magnitudes are equal, but the directions are the opposite. So to indicate that, we just put the negative in front. So vector TP is equal to negative vector TR. And then similarly, T to Q is negative vector TS. And if you wanted to, you could have written this the other way around. I suppose we could have gone negative TQ is equal to TS. Right? All I've done is move the negative from one side of the equation to the other. Either way is fine. They're both absolutely correct. Okay, one of the things that we, we still need to be able to do is we need to be able to refer to directions in a particular way. As I was saying in, in the diagrams, I can draw a line and, and tell you that two vectors are, are equal, but it's hard, to, it's hard to represent that the angles are actually the same, that the directions are the same. So here's three different ways that we can do it. One way is called the direction from the horizontal, which you'll be familiar with if you think of some trigonometry that we've done. Uh, a true bearing is, is a way of describing things. It's often used with uh, airplanes and ships. And a quadrant bearing is very similar to a bearing, but handled a little bit differently. So in this first row, all three of these descriptions are representing exactly the same angle. And I want to show you how each of the three work. So if we have 140 degrees to the horizontal, what that means is that we're going to start along the positive x-axis, and we're going to rotate in a counterclockwise direction 140 degrees. So 90 to get to here, and then another 50 degrees past. That creates an angle of 140 degrees. So 140 degrees to the horizontal, we're comparing that to the positive x-axis. And remember, that's exactly how we measured angles in standard position for trigonometry. So we might be used to that from advanced functions. The other one with a true bearing, the way a true bearing works is we start from directly north and we're gonna rotate clockwise. So we're starting, I'm gonna try and fit this all in the same diagram here. We're starting at north and we're gonna rotate 310 degrees in total going in a clockwise direction. So 90 gets us back to the x-axis. There's 180 degrees, 270 degrees. So I need to go another 40. And that takes me to exactly the same spot. So that's an angle of 310 starting at north going clockwise. Represents exactly the same direction as the original one in red. Just simply a different way of writing it. And then the quadrant bearing what it's doing is it, it's giving you a starting direction. So we're starting as if we're looking f directly north. And then the 50 degrees is saying how far to go in a particular direction. So we're going north, start at north, and then move 50 degrees to the west. So we're starting up here at north, and we're moving 50 degrees to the west. Again, exactly the same angle but a, simply a different way of representing it. So what we wanna do is let's see if we can represent these, these other examples using our, our different angle description types. So north 60 degrees east. That means we're gonna start looking north originally and we're gonna curve 60 degrees to the east. So originally we're looking north and go 60 degrees to the east. So it'll look Something like that. And don't get me wrong, this is not perfectly to scale. I'm not measuring this exactly, but by putting the angle in there, we're, we're representing what we wanted to. So north 60 degrees 
east would be considered a quadrant bearing. To do the true bearing, what we're doing, it's actually going to be pretty similar on this one. We're starting north and we're going to start rotating, remember counterclockwise. And to get to that same direction, I had to go 60 degrees again. So we just write the, the true bearing at 60 degrees. Now, one thing you'll notice in your textbook, and this is fairly common, they'll often write it as 60 degrees that way. So they put the zero in front. The intent of that is just to represent it as a three digit number. That way, all of your bearings are always recorded as three digits. Um, it's a little bit easier from a an actual direction standpoint for people that are actually trying to use it. Sometimes it looks a little bit confusing to us when we're not as familiar with it. Um, I'm not too concerned. You can write it down either way, but don't be surprised when you see that in the textbook. Then the direction from the horizontal. So this was the red one that we had done above. We're now starting on the positive X axis. We're going to rotate counterclockwise up until we get to that green line. And that should only be 30 degrees this time because remember we had 60 above, so 30 degrees there. So the direction of the horizontal would be 30 degrees. Okay, and example two. This time we're given the true bearing, 225 degrees. True bearing, we're gonna start looking north originally and we're going in a clockwise direction, 225 degrees. So we have to go past 90, past 180, and a little bit further. It's going to take us to about there, 225 degrees. So we've gone 45 degrees past due south, OK? So that, that's going to help to have that 45 degrees in there. Let's maybe try the quadrant bearing next then. Um, one of the, the little rules for a quadrant bearing, and it really is just a, a little rule, I suppose. The first letter is either going to be north or south. So above, we started with north. They tend to, to always start north and south. And then the second letter will be your east or west. OK, we don't tend to go the other way around. So with this angle down here, we need to describe that angle. But it's easiest to describe it south, first of all. So we're starting in as if we were heading south. And then we're going to turn. Oh, I've mixed up my colors, haven't I? We've gone south. And then we're going to go 45 degrees to the east. Oh, excuse me, not to the east, that's to the west. So south 45 degrees west will give us that angle. And then to do the direction from the horizontal, we always start on the positive x-axis, so we have to start there. And we start rotating counterclockwise until we get to that line. So that'll be 180 just to get to here, plus an extra 45. It's a total of 225 degrees to the horizontal. And this is just a couple of different ways that you'll see how we can represent angles. And we'll use a little bit of all three. Sometimes one's easier than the other, but it's a, it's an advantage just to have a few different possibilities. And there's some homework for tonight. So there's your first few questions. Just keep in mind uh, notation in particular. Make sure you're using your vector symbols properly. Uh, and trying to, to write everything down accurately. It makes it makes life a little bit easier later on as long as we have everything written down correctly.